Good evening, everyone. We begin by acknowledging that the Wiseman Art Museum in Northrop are located on, located on the traditional and contemporary land of the Dakota people. We aspire to honor and respect the indigenous peoples past, present, and future by incorporating indigenous knowledge in our work and establishing meaningful reciprocal relationships with carriers of indigenous knowledge and with communities. We also must acknowledge that the land acknowledgement is merely the first step in the long and complex process of reconciling with the colonial legacy of our institution. I would like to state our commitment to this process. I'm Katie Covey Spanier, the Director of Public Programming and Student Engagement at the Wiseman Art Museum. And tonight we'll hear from artists Seth Parker Woods and Spencer Topel in conversation with Professor Douglas Kearney on the occasion of their project, Iced Bodies, which in light of the ongoing and developing COVID situation will be presented in January 2023 as part of the Great Northern Festival. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our co-presenter for the evening, the Great Northern. The Great Northern celebrates our cold creative winters through 10 days of diverse programming that invigorate the mind and body. In an era of ch changing climate that threatens our signature season, we seek to create community, inspire action, and share the resilient spirit of the North with the world. Northrop Auditorium is rooted in the belief that the arts are essential to the human experience. Northrop is committed to cultivating intersections between performing arts and education for the benefit of all participants, now and for generations to come. A sponsorship from the University of Minnesota's Office of Equity and Diversity the Wiseman Student Group, WAM Collective, and the Student Services Fee Committee at the University of Minnesota, the voters of Minnesota for supporting the operational budget of our museum through funds from the Minnesota State Arts Board. A thank you to Wells Fargo Foundation Minnesota for supporting our operational budget. And I'm so grateful to my colleagues at the Great Northern and Northrop and the Wiseman for helping to make this event happen this evening. After the talk, we'd love to hear from you during the question and answer period. Please raise your hand and we'll go in the order that questions are received. We'll also be recording tonight's talk and it will be available on the Wiseman's YouTube channels. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our featured artists for the evening, Seth Parker Woods and Spencer Topel. Topel Woods is an artist collective creating visual art, music, installation, and experimental media. Their work prompts audiences and visitors to consider the role of art in relation to society, technology, and identity. Formed in 2017 by Spencer Topel and Seth Parker Woods, Topel and Woods' first major project was Ice Bodies, Ice Music for Chicago at the Arts Club of Chicago. Subsequently, they presented Ice Bodies at Dartmouth College in 2018 and the Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival in 2019. They continue to develop new work addressing society, culture, and race in performance and installation projects. The next iteration of Ice Bodies will be performed as part of the Great Northern Festival in 2023 at the Wiseman Art Museum. And our moderator for the evening, Douglas Kearney. Douglas has published seven collections, including the National Book Award finalist, Show, the award-winning poetry collection, Buck Studies, Libretti, Someone Took They Tongues, and Criticism, Mess, and Mess. Wire Magazine calls Fodder, a live album featuring Kearney and frequent collaborator Val Inc. brilliant. A Whiting Residence Fellowship from Cave Canon, the Rauschenberg Foundation, and others. Kearney is a McKnight Presidential Fellow and Associate Professor of Creative Writing and English at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Born in Brooklyn, raised in Athena, California, he lives in St. Paul with his family. Please welcome Seth, Spencer, and Douglas to the stage. And we're gonna begin with a short video of Iced Bodies.
How's everyone doing? Hello, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to be here, um, kind of discussing a little bit of the work with you, some background on how it started, where it started from, and how we kind of departed in its kind of um, evolution in these, I guess, five years, five, six years we've been at this, this wild beast. <laughs> Um, I'm Seth Parker Wood, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm Spencer Tafel. I'm Douglas. <laughs> so, I'm going to try to do so conveniently. <laughs> um, so, the overall concept, um, well, I guess the, well, really the conceptual idea of the, the, the ice cello in, in this situation comes from 1972 by the conceptual artist Jim McWilliams. Um, uh, in relation with um, the kind of the maverick cellist, muse, artist, um, Charlotte Moorman. Uh, for those that don't know, um, Charlotte Moorman, um, amongst many other things, was the founder of the New York Avant-Garde Arts Festival that started in the 1960s. Um, Jim McWilliams was a, for a long time, a printmaker based in Pittsburgh, uh, which is where they met. Um, I think in 68, I think is when the fit, one of their first times meeting. Um, but in 1972, Charlotte was scheduled um, to do a performance during the ISIS festival. That's actually the poster there that Jim McWilliams also made. Um, and in that performance, uh, originally she was scheduled to do, oh, am I doing it right? No, wrong one. Um, as she was scheduled to do another work by Namjoon Pike. Um, and there's a telegram that um, essentially uh, Jim did send out, uh, or maybe it was Charlotte, I think it was, um, asking for work. Um, and then that kind of became um, Ice Music for London, which was done at the Roundhouse. Um, and as it kind of goes, uh, the work kind of started out as um, the composer and kind of organizer curator, Anaya Lockwood, um, found a soft case cello bag and there was an ice creamery across the street from the roundhouse and they filled it with ice cubes and water and froze it and hoped for the best. <laughs> 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 and so there's an iconic photograph that you'll see, which is that one. one well, that's one of them there. That's right by Peter Moore. Um, which it doesn't look anything really like a cello, does yeah. it? Um, but I, I was fascinated. This is one of the photographs that I saw in 2011, that was kind of sent to me during this time, and I, I knew nothing about Charlotte, that just of the name and her having been very active in New York City, playing in the American Symphony Orchestra, um, and then her having worked with quite a few kind of uh, monumental um, artists who would go on that were very much so associated with the Fluxus art movement. Um, and it was in 2016 I returned to the to the States after having lived in Europe for about eight years um, as cellist, curator, person. Um, but what struck me most, uh, if you all can um, flow back to 2016, there's a lot of happening here in this country, let alone just the, the election, um, presidential election. Um, but I was so captivated and enraged in many ways by kind of having been feeling as if I was kind of cut off from actually a lot of the news that was happening here. And I was, it, when you live outside of the country in which you're from and the way you're, you're accustomed to getting the news or talking to people, you realize that the news agencies um, normally give you a 30 second to a minute kind of wrap up of whatever the hot, hot topics happening in your country. So coming back and kind of landing in Chicago and realizing it, so much of what was happening in that period in time um, filled me with a lot of sadness uh, and a lot of anger and trying to figure out what can I say, what can I do? Um, and I kind of fell back into this work, um, Ice, Ice Music for London, and meeting many curators at that time eventually, um, meeting the curators of the Block Museum at the Northwestern University and at that time, they were just preparing um, to put up 
at the time, well, it ceased for now, the largest retrospective of Charlotte Mormon and her life and the people that were involved with her, many of the artists that she collaborated with or curated during her years as uh, with the New York Avant-Garde Arts Festival. Um, and the meeting a bunch of other people. And eventually in that time, I also met Spencer Topel. <laughs> um, and we started brainstorming ideas about the work and what it could be, its history, original history. Are we recreating uh, a historical document or are we borrowing from it and moving it further? How do we find a place for it in that year? And so in, I think it was July 9th, 2017, we premiered at the Arts Club of Chicago. So these are just some, some articles and some things from the archive from that period. So this kind of lands us here. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say by, you know, um, the, there's, there's an interesting history around the ice cello about its misattribution to Namjoon Paik, right? He's a super famous artist, done a lot with like TV media, TVs, physical TVs. And so when TV cello failed in London, <laughs> probably likely to a power issue, you know, like power conversion or frequency conversion, couldn't get it to work. This panicky telegraph resulted in this, I think, really iconic image of Charlotte with the ice cello. Um, and I think has come to represent some, like a nexus of her, of her output or work, you know, um, her getting ar arrested on Carnegie Hall stage for playing nude. There's a very famous scene, if you can find it, where there's police officers lined up like, the, like you know, a big, a big show. And it's, it's this kind of very, tra you know, transgressive thing to, to do. And yet, you know, then you also combine the fluxus, which is, you know, fluxus is a movement around chaos. And they, they, they were almost kind of anarchists in a way. They didn't want to identify to one you know, uh, they didn't identify as a group even really. Like there was a disagreement about who the group is and yet the group was, is kind of in retrospect known to be very misogynist, you know, not inclusive of women. So when it was somebody like Charlotte in the scene was very um, um, kind of a, uh, an outsider to that group as well. So when we looked at this piece and a, a way to take it forward, one of the things we wanted to honor too was the, the fact that this work is about crossing barriers and crossing, um, you know, social mores and, and addressing things that are difficult for people to deal with. So, um, you know, when Seth contacted me and said, look, I want to dye this cello black and I want it to be about, I want us to create something new out of this. Not only does that line up well with the notions of re reproducing fluxus works, because there is no such thing as like one way to do fluxus works per se, or works from this period. But even in the archive itself and looking at and other reproductions of the ice cello, they were never done the same way twice. So for us, we see this work as like a really important extension. Um, and so when we started designing, we, we ran into some of the same problems that um, previous versions had encountered in trying to produce sound through the ice. So some of the early models we created produced sound through the ice very easily. We just did a class, um, was it yesterday? It feels like three weeks ago. It was yesterday. And it's very easy to get sound to come through the ice, but when the object gets bigger, it's a lot harder to pick up sound through that. So it was sort of a lot of, a lot of kind of process work um, that allowed us to arrive at that. This is actually an early model of the ice cello, and you can see that the neck is very thin. So it was, it was through a, a, if you want to progress through now, this is the first baby, baby cello. It's maybe like six inches tall. It's in the palm of your hand. <laughs> yeah. So part of it is- have one. <laughs> With this little ice cello, go ahead and do the next one. Um, we wanted to test dyes. Um, so this was really our color test in ice. And it, it actually was another very difficult thing to address because if you just use food coloring, it doesn't work. Um, food coloring in ice tends to separate very easily. And so you'll get either um, one region where all the dye is settled or um, kind of weird splitting of colors and so on. So we ended up kind of thinking like squid ink maybe, but we don't have the budget to do that and also the smell of it would be a whole different other thing. Um, and then we ended up on a very strange material like with a lot of glycerin and a cake icing coloring. And that ended up being the thing that we use um, to get that color and we tried a bunch of different dyes out and we ended up on this black dye. The next stage was to try to figure out how we're going to make this thing. Um, uh, obviously we could have had somebody carve an ice sculpture every time we do it. And in some cases, that's what happens with Charlotte's ice cellos. But sometimes they end up kind of cartoonish. Um, the one in Philadelphia, I think, just looks kind of silly. It has a 
really large um, um, head of the cello with a scroll, and the, the body's kind of wonky. So, you know, we thought we moved to casting partly because we also needed to cast pickups in the eyes. And so even if we had a card, we'd have to then embed, and, and so it just was very tricky. So we ended up utilizing a lot of 3D um, fabrication techniques, CNC. Uh, we, this is a violin scale model um, that we created, learned a lot from that model about thickening the neck, and eventually we um, did the object out of this foam. And Seth came to visit, we tried it, and um, he got to actually hold it. So I think this was an important stage just to make sure it ergonomically made sense as some kind of cello object. Obviously, it's not an exact idea of a cello, but one thing we really wanted to preserve, and I think this carries into kind of the, the piece, is how to create an aura and a beauty of the object so that the audience could be there kind of witnessing that loss with us. Like, it was very important that the object wasn't cartoonish or silly or just kind of too abstracted away from a, you know, a beautifully sculpted object because you kind of want to, when you see him start to strike it, scratch it, mar it, people need to feel that that kind of panic a little bit of, this is upsetting me, you know, uh, stop doing that, it looks beautiful. So um, there's some other, you know, some of the technical stuff that went into this was, was rather challenging, making a mold. Um, we were very ge generous, there's a, the Dartmouth um, Engineering School effectively donated the silicone for us to make it, we couldn't afford it then, it's like $6,000 worth of silicone um, to cast this object. Um, and which we, we know nothing about. Which we know nothing about, <laughs> exactly. We got a lot of engineering help. And after several failed attempts to cast the ice cello because of leaking from the mold, you're dealing with 125 pounds of water. Um, you know, we found a way to clamp it and seal it, and this was the first um, ice cello made in the ice labs at, at Dartmouth. So, um, in any case, uh, I don't know if we even needed to talk about it. Um, <laughs> I think this this is important, though. Um, we, as the students yesterday found out, ice on its own uh, has a very, I would say, percussive, um, you know, harsh, non-tone-based sound. It's like you strike the ice, and it kind of has a sharp sound to it, but it doesn't produce a tone per se unless you break or split or fracture it. So, if you've ever been on a lake and you hear the ice singing. That's fractures forming in the ice. But if you just like hit it with a hammer, you know, you've heard it. It doesn't, doesn't sound like much. So we thought, it, you know, how do we prolong that attack or that energy that we put into the cello? And how do we prolong and make it musical or evoke musical qualities? And we were ex examining different materials, I think, at the time, right, Seth? Like wood, metal, plastic. Yeah, so I think one of the, the, the I guess, first ones, um, was sheet metal. Yeah, that's right. Um, there was a lot of research that was being done at IRCOM uh, with um, Adrian Manu, Manu, Manu mm -hmm. Mamou, yeah. uh, <laughs> in the gesture uh, department. And some of that had, I worked with, with him there in those years I was living in Europe. And the idea of kind of embedding and um, embedding transducers, but also trying to find a way to kind of create membranes out of one one larger object the without body. having yeah. a, an array of speakers in, in a way that all the sound is contained kind of from one source. So we applied this, and I want to go back a little bit, because mm, yeah. 78, Jim and Charlotte decided, and I only discovered this because of the amazing Joan Rothfuss and her, all of her very <laughs> important interviews with Jim McWilliams and the transcripts from that. Um, he talks about this um, trying to amplify it, but with kind of a failed attempt at it. Um, and that was kind of the key. Okay, they're onto something. They really were trying to expand this. So I, I want to make sure that we do <laughs> talk about that. And so the idea of embedding um, pickups or piezos or microphones kind of came into the picture here as a way of kind of giving it a voice and, and being able to kind of really amplify that decay of a, such an ephemeral object. And, and I think too, um, you saw the beginning of the video. There's no, there's no sound. Uh, it doesn't make sound right away. And actually, we, we kind of cut that a little bit short so you wouldn't be watching just like 15 minutes of this. But actually, it's really important. I think in the beginning, it doesn't. The sound comes from, the, from Seth touching the object, from moving across it, that you're given that moment to have a kind of phantom sound, a musical experience that's kind of in your own imagination. And the cello, I think, is an incredibly evocative object that way because 
even when he's bowing, I can, you know, I hear, I hear cello music. So, you know, we wanted to have that be a very gradual emergence so that people started to question whether they were hearing it themselves, they were imagining that voice, that sound in their head, or it was actually happening. And we'll get to some of the reasons why that's important later too. Getting to the glass just quickly, um, it, there's an amazing artist named Liz Phillips. Um, I met in New York City, I think it was in the, the spring before we staged the first Must time. So 2016, 2017. Yeah, it would have early. been early. It would have been just, yeah, in the winter of 2017, like February, March. There was a there was a conference around transducers, and she presented a whole thing around food and transduction and water and transduction. And she's she she was she's kind of, I think, very much one of the real expert experimentalists who've tried everything with, with making sound into objects. And I, I said, look, we were looking at a material to try to figure out for this piece. It's with ice. You know, we have we've tried metal and you know, other materials. She's like, no, no, don't use metal, use glass. I'm like, well, why? And she said, well, it's cr the crystalline structure of glass, the fast response of the sound in the glass, it, it's almost like it's the same material. And we, you came and visited, I think, after we, we did that. We got some glass panels, and we, it was like an aha moment. We're like, okay, this is giving, um, this is giving the um, ice a voice. You know, it's giving it a, a way to sing. And immediately when we, I think, First time we tried it was when we when we did it in Chicago. But I could just see you getting into it and really playing the sound. And people often ask us, "What are you doing? What is he doing?" We're really creating that piece together in the moment. And I'm responding to his gestures, and he's responding to what he's hearing. And as it's changing, he's responding, and we're kind of playing off of that tension. So the glass is actually kind of the third actor in this this case, and it spatializes the sound. It, each glass panel is a different tone, so it's never going to be the same way twice. We could stage, unless we had the exact same glass panels, which we don't. So, um, yeah, this is from uh, Arts Club, but it's gone through a number of machinations where we have used more panels or less panels. I think for the presentation that we'll be doing here in the Wiseman, we'll have quite a few more glass panels that will fill out the exterior gallery. So, so essentially, they wrap around the entire audience. Yeah. Um, here, they'll be even more immersive uh, at the WAM, so we're quite excited about that. Kind of finding a new way, a more site-specific way to really create a, kind of an immersive experience where maybe it's not that you're watching us ex directly, you're more like sitting in the, in the gallery or a sitting space just, just to experience the sounds and watch them evolve over time. Or walking around, walking around, around me, around Spencer, standing or sitting slightly beside me, not too close. <laughs> I'm wielding objects. That, that, that also takes us back to the first time we did this because uh, in Chicago we had a projection of Mormon's works, I think, in the other room. So you could, you could experience the work just by listening. And I think it's important to be able to reflexively see it but also hear it and, and to be able to have those two experiences either be together or separate, which is what we're going to mm -hmm. kind of recreate here. Yeah. So this is our durational, kind of our... The blueprint, let's call it that, for the score, the, um, the, um, the musical side of it. There's another score, which is just a choreographic score for myself that kind of outlines a lot of the different movements um, in which I'm creating um, on the spot, or not really, but um, over the course of the performance and how I can segment those to create new sounds or new attacks or new impulses that can, Spencer can work off of. And of course, we've changed this over time, and sometimes I ignore some of the stuff that's in there completely, but it's kind of, we have to work uh, by osmosis, I guess, in a yeah, yeah. way. <laughs> I think it's worth saying that, like, you know, it's, I think the piece has evolved because of how many times we've done it to more like there are different kinds of states or moods or places that we inhabit that these are suggesting. So for example, it says like poem one, poem two, et cetera. Those become materials that play both through the ice, we actually have a speaker embedded in the ice, and also play through the glass. And those are poems that are deliberately selected. You know, Seth and I selected, he found this amazing poet. Um, Nair Wahid. Nair Wahid, and we have two poems that we record and get played, and they're about dressing the body, about the spirit, about the connection between the two. I mean, I, maybe you can even give a little more. We actually have the poems, I think, in the next. So, Nair poem. Wahid, when I first yeah. came back to the States, um, as you do, you kind of doom scroll on social <laughs> media, on the socials. Um, and I was seeing every day um, just an image 
of one of these poems, not necessarily these. One of these, actually the left one, was one of the ones that she did publish that, I, that caught my eye. Um, she would never show her face. You'd only see, the page was only just littered with just the poems from this specific book, Salt. Um, and, I, and people were sharing them and resharing them and they were just showing up everywhere. And then eventually, like, I think there was a New York Times thing that came out about it. Uh, and I was just so captivated how she was capturing the times in a way. Um, and people finding resilience, finding their voice inside of these words. And then like, maybe these are some of the words that can um, pay tribute in many ways to mental illness, that can pay tribute to self, that can pay tribute to psyche. So a large part of Difficult Grace is creating a commentary, commentary on failed judicial systems to support people, but also around the stigmas connected to mental illness, specifically schizophrenia. In the time that I moved back to Chicago, between 2014 and 2016, the city of Chicago and the police department or judicial system had paid over $28 million connected to cases um, of road cops. And I was, <laughs> this was a very sobering moment. Um, and of those, 20% of those cases were connected to individuals that had mental illness, uh, had suffered from mental illness. And, and well, you've seen it time and time again, I don't need to really expound upon this. Um, and this is something I wanted to really draw attention to and create a commentary around, but also a space of healing from that, from people that could connect and see themselves in a way, from the sound installation side of this. Um, so these, these words become kind of in, in many ways embedded inside of it as it part of the voice one is trying to, to free out or provide freedom for in, in, in the sense of it be, them being shackled inside of it. Um, so, so that, that's these two works. Um, and they're quite amazing. The first one appears in the first half of the work. It's very much so shrouded inside of the sounds of the eyes, inside of the playing, inside of the caressing, the scribing I do inside, the names of victims that have, that have, been, that have kind of graced the media and those that have not, that are, that are only um, known via the, the, um, the families um, that many of us will never know. Um, and then the erasure of those, the healing of those, the smearing of the ice and of the, the melting um, ice in the water in the, as a way of trying to heal those wounds and, and close them back up. Um, and then the second one comes at the very, towards the very end of the work. And it's very much so a call, a call to action, um, a way of reckoning with oneself at the same time. And it's such a powerful work that kind of Spencer eventually just plays it on a loop. And once there is no more of the, of, of the ice, of the cello, of the edifice, of the body, the, the decapitated neck, um, all you hear is kind of this mantra that rotates over and over and eventually it subsides into nothing. Yeah, and I, I don't think there's a video of it yet. yet. I mean, we have a, the full video from Huddersfield, but actually Seth re releases the, the transducer, the speaker from the ice and th that's making the sound. So we hear it in the glass, but we also hear it in this object and he holds it up kind of in triumph almost and then cradles it uh, into his chest and lies down. It's very... That's a very choreographed moment, but it's, it's so poignant because it, it really gives the piece a sense of arrival, and that's what we've really been working towards. So while we have this destruction of this object, we're, it's actually this kind of emancipation, right, mm -hmm. you know, of the voice. It, so these are just some photos I'm just cycling through here. Well, this, this one's kind of amazing. This is, you kind of, you were saying this the other day, like maybe you were talking about the, holding it like a shield or like to protect yourself. That's what I see when, when I see... It's both shield, but also this is a moment after the, the cello, the, the neck, you said is what removed. they call it, is removed. Um, and it goes from being an instrument to body, and I give it humanity in that way by bringing it to my... My head becomes the head of this torso, this, I mean, basically this torso. So there's lots of imagery that's kind of built inside of this work, being able to see be seen in this way, you know, be seen to, for one to be able to kind of bear their all and be vulnerable um, and to expose, but to be able to stand in that, in that truth and the complexities of who we are as people. And just some more photos. I mean, this is, I, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, so this is the Huddersfield performance and Huddersfield 
is Northern England. I don't know if you've ever visited this place. Uh, it's it's a very kind of, I would say, stern, very uh, often industrial towns. Um, you know, so th they have their own, you know, imbued sense of like resilience. I think um, the, this festival is very famous. Uh, Huddersfield Festival of Contemporary Music and Contemporary Art. They, they, you know, BBC actually makes a schlep up from London to record the performances. We talked to Radio Four that week. They later played this broadcast of a spatial recording on Radio Three. The whole whole thing. But one of the things that's really poignant here is that the audience, you know, they stayed for the whole thing. You know, so this is this was I think a real tribute to their, you know, intensity and desire to see this through. And, and what we did yeah. mention is the performance ranges from two hours to two and a half hours. Yes, <laughs> it's a long so. time. No, no intermission. <laughs> so, you know, we were all, we're always really surprised when people stay through the whole thing. But uh, in this case, it, it was really wonderful because, you know, after, it, you know, after Seth and I push out all this energy and emotional stuff, there was a wonderful standing ovation of this piece. And you know, it felt like they, it was really a a, a, moment, a highlight. You know, um, so yeah, that was that was 2019. Um, here's another great shot of it. Um, here you can see the ice kind of splattering out of out of the frame. Um, and this is what it looks like at the end. <laughs> Just you know, guts. Um, you know, the stains of the the water and ice and the, the dye. Um, and in, in many respects, the pedestal is also a kind of thea theater piece in this. You know, the idea is that it, it, it's carved with a pattern on the top, which is to, it's actually a, it, it's taken from Soviet mortuary tables. So it's the idea is it is a kind of both like presentation plinth pedestal, but it's also um, an, a, a place of kind of br dissection um, and there's the idea of having the pool in the, the center is really to focus the attention and to capture the, the ice and the liquid. It's not so it just runs out everywhere. It's a kind of to respect the fact that this is, this is being held back. Um, and there's a kind of pool, you know, a kind of drain. And the drain is a reference to the shape of the cello. It's an inversion, kind of upside down imprint of the cello into the, into the pedestal. Um, and, and, you know, it's really great to see the, the water, the reflection. I mean, we don't have the picture there, but the, the reflection of Seth in the pool creates an amazing kind of commentary of, 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 of how this all fits together. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's have some applause for the presentation if people feel like that. <laughs> all right, so, you know, full disclosure, um, Seth and Spencer and I had a, had a brief conversation a couple of days ago, and I'm, while we have vowed to not pretend to restate <laughs> things that were just <laughs> awesome about that conversation, we might refer to a previous conversation. That's what, that's what, we're, what we're referring to. But I actually don't want to start there. Um, you know, one of the things you were, all, were talking about earlier is, you know, in working with the Mormon piece and thinking about whether you were, I think the phrasing was creating a historical document or borrowing, I, I'm, I'm interested in the sense of something different, which is lineage, right? Um, to imagine this as a kind of work of culture and a practice and one in which we're thinking about body, um, we're thinking about the kind of enfleshment of a body. Um, so that makes me think about lineage. And, I, and I'm curious as to how you feel like as time has moved from the original uh, presentation and the and perhaps the questions, the social questions that the piece asks have shifted in some ways and, and changed in others. I, I'm curious as to how you feel that inheritance has functioned. Mm -hmm. What changes about uh, the dynamics, if not the stakes, right? What changes about the dynamics as as the piece now lives in this iteration? Um. I mean, I, I guess uh, grappled with that early on, and there definitely were questions that came up about this. Uh, one large part of this is I don't do this work nude. And uh, as Charlotte did it um, every single time, and she would change kind of the attire, mostly the adornment, uh, the flowers in her hair, the lay in her hair. She also stitched flowers and 
into her nether regions, uh, as well that match the flowers in which what, what was public we could see. Um, so part of that is because one is, is a protective tool, because at the end of the day, I still am a concert cellist, and I still have to go on and do other things after this performance. Um, the other is, is a, a larger part of this is because there, there is so much imagery around the subjectification of black and brown bodies on display, on chopping blocks, being sold. Da, 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 da. So I, in a way, I was trying to make sure that I was reclaiming the body in which I inhabit and those that have come before and will come after me. So in that way, I do move in a different direction from Charlotte, um, which you know, I've come under criticism from art historians, et cetera, et cetera, friends that knew her, uh, those that produce projects with her in the past. Um, but that's, that's a decision, and I think she paid a deep price regarding her health for this down the line. Um, so I had to be very conscious about this. And in talking with a good friend of mine, Joan Jean Renault, who was the second cellist to do this work in 1999, here actually in Minneapolis at the Walker, uh, she, this is where the idea, actually one of the first ideas to wear the wetsuit came from. It was in conversations with her. Um, because she too <laughs> had to go on to be a professional cellist afterwards. Um, but the, in, in, in the work evolving and, and me seeing kind of how far Charlotte kind of went with the work and where we are now with it, um, it's been exciting um, just to try to pick up and, and still honor, honor that and not feel as if I'm shying away from it or that it, it, it is something different. Ice Bodies very much so is of the times, but I think in the same way she was really trying to expose uh, doctrine, expose history, expose the complexities that is already within that and in a way of being not being shy um, of, of being being nude, of being of um, I guess being vulnerable on the stage in a way that so many, especially during that time, the kind of respectability of politics, what was it to be a woman in this time? What was it to be a classical musician in this time? What was it to be? Uh, a performer on a stage in this time, which is what were mo many of the reasons she was arrested in that time was to push against that. Um, and so even now it's, it's us trying to push against that once more, or push against the kind of the stereotypes of what is it to be, um, to just to be and to be seen you know, in these times and trying to hold on to that at the same time while still trying to bring in the current social issues that were actually at the same time, even then, <laughs> also uh, prevalent, but just trying to give a voice to them in a way, yeah, now. Yeah, and I, I think to add to that, um, you know, I, I think some of Charlotte's work with, say, Namjoon Pike was incredibly sculptural. You know, these amazing images of her becoming a cello, for example. She does a piece near to with Namjoon where she holds this, a string taut, and, you know, he plays her, and then there's TV cello and Sky Kiss, and I think these have really strong visual components, I felt like when we had this opportunity to, to kind of reimagine this piece is the way I think about it, um, it was to really also address the installational sculptural part. It was because, you know, this is the first like lar largest sculptural object I've ever worked on and I was really intrigued with the idea of work making a musical instrument edifice, like a, you know, and, and making something that I think would also give respect to the instrument, you know, and its, its visual presence and aura. So, in that sense, I, I felt like we were also part of completing a larger arc of what this piece was about. I mean, sure, I'm sure Charlotte would have loved, I mean, Jim said as much, I, she, he, I think she would have loved this version of it because of, of what you've done here. And he said he loved that it made sound. And so I think there is that lineage part. And I, I think in, in any of these circumstances where you kind of reimagine or recreate works, what you're actually doing is like what Seth is giving, honoring these works, honoring these artists, and making them more available to people today. You know, in no cases have we ever tried to hide that this is where it comes from. It's something we celebrate. And that's a very different attitude towards, you know, faithfully, you know, versus the kind of like patriarchal kind of Western colonial idea of like this is the composer with a capital C. No, we're participating in a conversation that evolves through time and we're a part of it. And I, I really sincerely hope somebody comes along or another duo comes along in the future and makes another version of this and re- Imagine this work in a completely new way. That would be very exciting. So, yeah. I'd I mean, absolutely. And I've been thinking about that. You know, it gives me so many 
directions that I could possibly talk about in terms of, you know, as you said, like going back to the sculptural aspect of it or, or amplifying, no, no pun intended, the sculptural aspect of it. Um, what, you, what you all might have seen in some of the different photographs or some of the different gestures that, uh, and, and activities and relations that Seth is having with the object, uh, with the cello, um, but something that I hadn't seen in some of the earlier, in some of the videos that I'd watched previously before seeing this one, um, was the, the, the caressing and the tenderness. And, and what I saw in that opening was actually something that, and I might be mispronouncing this, but something that reminded me of the kind of classical composition of the Pieta, you know, the cradling of, of, of Jesus by Mary, which takes me, of course, to the uh, Nair Wahid uh, poems, which uh, the one that begins, what massacre happens to my son? Um, so I'm curious about perhaps talking us through some of the different gestures, the different relationships you had, and what was the process of discovering those? You mentioned inscription, you know, early on, which, which if you see it in the video, I mean, there's an ice pick or a chisel, or an, and, it's, and it looks quite violent compared to the caressing and the, almost the soothing, the balm that is also embalming, like all of that. So I'm curious about your relationship to the object to the cello, and then how you're translating that as you're playing alongside each other. It, well, that's a lot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> how many do I, I start? Sorry, college professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's, um, as we're prototyping this, it's like, how do you prepare to play a cello made of ice. It's not like you can go out to a store and just buy one or to go to a violin shop and like, I'm gonna just try this thing out real quick. Um, <laughs> so a lot of kind of coming up with some of the early ideas as far as you think about the gestures um, came from some of the prototypes in the very beginning. I mean, you don't see in th many of these photos we don't share. Um, it's just as freezing ice and like Tupperware. <laughs> Just to get an idea, what does it look like clear? What does it look like black? Can we see this? Can we see that? How does it sound between the two? Does, it, does the, the, the changing of, just the dying of it, does that change the sound altogether? But then also, how does the ice react? How do I react to different types of tools with them? Mm -hmm. um, and what could that look like? And then what can that sound like? Can I min what can I, how can I manipulate many of these things? And what does that feel like? physically, what do certain types of gestures just innately inside of me that don't resemble playing the cello? Because the idea was not like, oh, I'm gonna be up here and I'm gonna play the cello. And, you, and what I'm playing, imagine you're hearing the box suites. Imagine you're hearing Beethoven's A major sonata. No, that is not, it was, it's, it's kind of to go completely left field and go in a completely different direction. There is the, the image that, that I evoke in many ways and there is a specific type of sensual, well, Playing the cello is a sensual act. I'm just gonna say that I don't care what anyone else says. Um, it's probably the object you know the best yeah. in your entire life, especially if you started like I did at five years old. Yeah. So, so I mean, you know well, it you know, very it's a well. Neck, a body, and a waist. I mean, it, that's the description it, of the it, instrument. <laughs> uh, I don't think yes. Seth is gonna say this, but I mean, he's trained as a dancer and, and movement. And this is such an important difference because I think, you know, I'm a violinist, but I could not do any of the gestures, making them look that majestic and that deliberate and intentional. Um, so I just want to say that, that <laughs> you actually bring this wealth of performance and movement, you know, to imbue to this project that is so critical, I think. Yes. <laughs> so essentially, I create these choreographic, choreographic scores. Um, in many ways, uh, like the choreo choreographer, Antoinette de Kiesmaka, who founded Rosa's company in Belgium, she talks about um, kind of choreographic constellations that really one can only see from above. So essentially what we see is a very, what you see from the stage is a very specific type of angle in which we're experiencing the lines and the story, the narratives. So that's essentially what I did, which is why you start to see there are moments, I think at the very end of the video, that we, the example we showed here where I pulled the cello to kind of a tabletop version. And on that is kind of essentially the bed, which and I kind of plant a lot of the different types of gestures. Many of them is thinking about the idea, is this a body? What does that feel like to caress and to coddle and to, um, to move it through time? Um, what is it to share that kind of intimacy, that type of, that type of love? Other moments, 
um, is in my hands. Well, on the, the the neoprene gloves that I wear, they're um, they're rough on one side of them, so that part also adds another layer, kind of to this the sonic. Uh, textures in which one is hearing, but also for me, it's a kind of a tactile experience. And so, really, using those tools, but also just my hands and what that can, what can that yield for me personally, um, and then how the actual object um, responds to that. And I really didn't. I learned, I think, the most about working with this and what gestures really. Um, were going to work for me in in performance because I had a whole like two pages of ideas and lines and 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 part of the my choreographic score um, and many of them I, I used many of them I did not use and still to this day have not because they just didn't translate in the right way because when you're dealing with this this cello this this sculpture it's solid it really truly is solid and it feels like a monolith this thing you can't get in or around in some ways it's just there. And it's like, how do I now manipulate myself around? And I learned the most from the very first performance or performances because I ended up doing it twice back to back. Um, we happened to have two ice cellos in the very yeah, first that was a mistake. premiere. And, and so I, mean, I, the, I learned a lot. The art club time. was like, can you do it again? <laughs> so it was, it was amazing to kind of work in this way and see uh, what can kind of come out of the, this, these experiences and um, what resonated the most for me. And I've just kind of added more gestures or segmented parts of them um, uh, as, as a way of kind of moving through the rest of the score, the, the longer score, the longer end game, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Seth has control of like what happens physically activating the objects and the movements and the gestures. Um, it's sort of my role to like then shape the emotional landscape, those gestures translate into sound and music and, and, and feeling. You know, that's the, it's sort of creating composition spontaneously between us. And I would say that, like I said earlier, it's really reflexive. You know, if Seth is really grooving on something and he's, he has a, he's producing a pattern or rhythm, I'll feed off of that and we'll create some, a moment together and we'll let that persist. You know, I could easily just shut it all off like the minute I'm playing, but that's, that's not what we're doing. And so we're really working in these different spaces. And I'll say that one thing that really started to evolve later, most recently in the last, I would say, two or even just the last performance, is a lot more of that healing space, that reflective, that kind of caressing became such an important, you know, ex uh, gesture that we needed a way to express, you know, kind of give that more room in the piece. And so really we're moving between these different spaces of, of emotions and it's also important that, to say there's a lot of these moments where there's a lot of silence because, you know, I think it's an important part of this piece that you hear the room, you hear each other. It becomes about coming, you know, bringing us back to we're just together. together. Yeah. And yet, you know, the sound comes most when we split, you know, <laughs> with the ice itself, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, thinking about, there was something that, that you said earlier, Seth, is this a body? Um, one of the most sort of beautiful images uh, is when, as you described it, your neck and your head become the neck and the head of the cello. Um, and something we talked about a little bit in a previous conversation, but, but, but now we'd like to uh, maybe, maybe put a different kind of angle on it, is the fluctuation of the cello from being an object, a monolith, that you progressively become more able to hold and then perhaps you can substitute as a part of its body and then eventually maybe it's a table. So there's that kind of sense of, of, of movement between you, yourself and the object and then we have the sound that is, that it, that's, that's also an additional sound, right, that's coming and sort of like fractalizing what any of these singular objects would be singular performances, singular actors would be, kind of gets fractalized across this space. So I guess what I'm saying is, when is it, when is it trouble to have that kind of ability to replace or to metonymize or to me make metaphor? Like when are the moments where you're feeling a kind of tension between the idea of, oh, this is a body. Like, like when, how does that kind of transferring between uh, uh, work uh, for you? It, you know, it's such a long game. 
<laughs> in this piece. And so I don't think there are specific moments in my head where I'm seeing it as a body, where I'm seeing it as a sculpture, where I'm seeing it as a cello, where I'm seeing it as just this very cold thing against me and I'm trying to get warm. <laughs> Which is it's real. Um, it's quite cold. Um, and um, there is a work um, from I think it's 1968 by Giuseppe Chiari called Per Arco, which also uh, Charlotte became very famous for performing. And um, it's just her, most of it is just movement and motion with the cello. And it's almost like she's caressing this body most of the entire time. And then eventually, the, at one moment, it's, it's on record, you see her start crying with it. And it's just the sound of planes bombing. Um, and this is kind of like the backdrop. And then she starts to actually play only after this kind of field recording uh, subsides. So this is something that kind of goes, that has kind of gone through my mind in, in moments. Um, but I guess we talk about the trouble. Um, you know, I feel that from the very <laughs> from the very beginning of the piece, it's like, where do you start and where do I go and what am I going to do and each time? It's like, how do I make it different than the last time? And what are the things that I remember from before? What are, what's embedded inside of me? What is muscle memory? Um, and what can I pull as a extract from the audience? Um, just from the energy, because obviously no one's saying anything to me. They're all just eyes staring, like now. Uh, <laughs> But what can one pull from that? And as it's morphing, as I see the cello go from this frozen state to starting the, the first defrost state where it looks completely crystalline and then my gloves wash it away for the first time. So that's also a part of the first thing, almost as if one is giving themselves a bath or giving a child a bath. You know, I have vivid memories of my late father, you know, holding me in the shower, you know, in these short shorts. This is like the early 80s. Um, <laughs> and to bathe me in this idea, this very sacred practice. I think we, so many of us have this, have this kind of memory. This is the beginning for me. And so in a way it is human, but it's also I'm caring for, just like my own child, I call it my child in a way. It's like my most expensive child. I spent a lot of money. <laughs> A lot of money wow. on. Um, so this is part of that thing for me as I'm, I'm kind of working through it. And I think when the neck comes off, it becomes very real. And it's like, okay, where are we now? Where are we going? You know, And how do I not put the, um, the hardness of what, what I'm doing here, where it does sometimes look as if I'm excavating a body? How do I not um, hold on to that? Because in the first few performances, it was very hard for me to not shoulder that, especially when I was scribing the names of victims inside, on top of, on the sides of, of, of the ice cello. And how do I release that? How do I not be the, um, the vessel for that forever afterwards? So it's, it's a negotiation game the entire time and trying to make sure it's not just only visual imagery, but there is um, there's a vivid score that one is producing that people can hold on to. So it, because it can, the piece can get very heavy very quickly. And it's trying to make sure we hold space for lightness inside of all of it throughout the entire work. Yeah, I mean, to your point about trouble, I mean, the, you know, the thing that always runs through my mind when we start is, you know, so I have to preface this by saying, you know, there's a joke in, I don't know, electronic music performances, new music performances with electronics that the electronics will never work, you know? So there's always this thing when you don't hear any sound, you're like, oh, it's all broken, you know? And we literally start the piece silent and it sounds broken, you know, nothing's happening. And I'm always like, is there too much silence? And I always feel like when I watch, kind of think back, it's not enough. You know, there's almost like, we want, I want more. So more space, more emptiness. And I always think it's like too much silence. <laughs> So there's your attention. Um, but I also think in the similar way with the poems kind of emerging from obfuscation, from hiding in the glass and hiding in, in these kind of filtered sounds, there's a question of when do they emerge? You know, 
when is it too soon for them to emerge? Or, you know, because really, like, we want people, I, I think we really want people to be receptive to these words and what they're saying, what they're meaning. So there's always this moment where we get to and we just sort of feel like, okay, this is it. We, it has to come out now. Um, and I think that's where the, the, the audience really is confronted with that trouble. You know, it, it's come to head. If they haven't felt it yet, <laughs> it, they're going to feel it then. And they need to. You know, that's such a big part of this. Because it's human, and I think it gets directly to the psyche. It's no longer the soundscape, but it's actual, it's a human voice. Whose voice? Because I've said nothing, so they don't even know it's me. Um, but it, it is me. Now you all know. Don't tell anybody. Uh, <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> but it becomes very human in this way, and it allows you to really process the words of Wahid. Um, and as that goes on, and, and it's multiple cycles, or it's the parsing of parts of the stanzas um, together, and it's like, what is happening here? Mm -hmm. And we leave you, there, there is no, we we're not interfering with that, we're just laying it out there, and on top of all the other imagery there, yeah. I mean, it's the dynamic of absence and presence, right? The, 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 the presence of the ice cello, um, looks in some place like it disappears, although it's, it's now, it's all over you, it's all over the planet, and so it's there, it's not gone. Um, and thinking about what it means to, to cut into a surface that is going to take a little bit of time to melt away that trace. So how long is it there? How deep does it get into it? You know, it's something to think about a lot. And, and you know, seeing the remains of the ice um, and just thinking about like charred buildings or, you know, you know, what oftentimes attends, uh, you know, these murders um, becomes the, the, the horrible property damage. <gasps> we have to, oh, the poor CVS. You know, we have to um, think about that, but that kind of sense of what that trace is. But there's, there's only a, a, another minute before I want to open it up to you all, so kind of get your, your questions ready. And something I just like to say before I open questions up is, is like, please, like, ask the question that you're really curious about. You know, you don't have to like audition to, to ask a question. So just like ask one that you really care about because they're here right now and they, you know, they might not come back, you know. Um, <laughs> until 2023 is a long time. Um, so, so the last thing I kind of want to think about, <laughs> you, know, you know, see, there you go, there you are. I don't want them to ask the question. <laughs> like, like maybe, maybe, the, no. Um, I think one of the last things I wanted to just sort of think about with you briefly is this idea of iced. Um, there is iced as in the slang for murdered. There is iced as in the slang, as in, as in the idea of preserving a body, right? There's iced as the literal cake icing that's gone into it. And then there's like the kind of idea of iced as in being covered with wealth or, or, or gems or jewelry. And so all of these different stages are, are sort of functioning in that sort of space. And I, and I guess I want to say is, you know, to now sort of reverse it from thinking about the, the cello as being this, this, this changing object. What's happening at a bodily level for you as you're moving through all of these? You mentioned being cold, right? But you know, and that's important. That's <laughs> an important phenomenological thing to talk about. But what's happening to you as a performer in this space? And what's happening to you as a performer in this space having to attend to, to both presences in that way? So I'm, I'm just curious about what's happening to your bodies as you're doing this? Um, a lot. <laughs> uh, doing this work, um, I'll preface it because I, I'm not an ice carver. I never have been an ice carver. And that's a very specific type of physicality. And when in the early, the early days, the early years <laughs> of doing this work um, and, and meeting the, the ice carver um, that provided a lot of help for us, especially when we were preparing this for Chicago and the one that gifted me all these amazing Japanese carved ice carving tools. Um, he has this very specific type of musculature. And in every performance, uh, my body kind of goes under a lot of arrest. Um, one, I'm holding this extremely um, solid sculpture and having to support it 
um, so using my entire yeah, body, so even though there are 125 you know, pounds of ice, you know, I mean, this isn't a light object. Yeah. So what I'm, even though with the two blocks that kind of use it as a support beam or, you know, structure, my body is the one that's really holding most of that. Um, whether it's me upright or in the tabletop, upright tabletop, moving it, um, the coldness that is there, the swelling that actually happens, and just the emotions around all of this, and the breaking down over time. And sometimes I feel like I am the one that's breaking down, and even um, which is why there are these moments of pause because it's like one can't do this for two hours just straight without a break. Um, the dying of my of, of of my skin. So by the end of it, what you don't see, most don't see is when I take off the wetsuit, my skin has turned purple from the absorption of the dye and being kind of toiling inside of this. And I remember in the first performance, the people saw it, they thought I, I had gotten frostbite or something and I had Rude. destroyed myself. And I was like, no, it's just the dye. My hands, yes, are twice the size uh, <laughs> that they normally are, but it's one has to undertake a lot um, and to shoulder all of that. And it's the idea of like, how do I release that afterwards? So, um, and it's part of the performance, just like for Charlotte, it was part of kind of going through that process. So, I know something, oh, it's so cool, it's so glamorous, but it's not really that glamorous. And I've learned how to kind of cope with the emotions psychologically and physically that I have to put myself through to deliver such a work, you know, for the consumption of, of the artists, of the curators, of the presenters, of my colleagues. Um, and those that dare not to do it, those that dare not to look directly on, that, that look away. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say for me, you know, we, we deliberately wanted the, my role in the performance to not be the visual focus of the piece. You know, it's removed back. It's, I wouldn't say it's hidden because it's there, but it takes on the role of the, of, of, of the observer, the witness. And it requires an enormous amount of attention. I mean, two hours just locked on, focused, listening, ex feeling, re being receptive to what he's doing. And I think that notion of guiding the witness of it is really important because there's a lot. There's just a lot of emotions, and I, I sometimes can read the room too, like what how people are reacting to it. And you know, I I will say that like in Chicago, there was some really poignant moments where between the black members of the audience and the white members of the audience, the reactions were so different. You know, I could read the guilt and the pain and the kind of staring the problem in the face from the white people and the black people are, were happy that it was being shown. They were like, had their son, the guy had his son there. He was sitting with his son in his lap. He's like, look, you know, somebody's talking about this. It's like, it's being shown. And so that role of the witness, I think, is really important to this piece, is giving it a kind of sanctity, creating that space where it's a ritual. It's something that has to be attended to, is, is kind of the, how I absorb it. And when I finish, my, I've just been sitting there the whole time, but I'm completely like emotionally, physically exhausted, too. Maybe not in the same ways, but just kind of in that kind of fixed poise, you know, until the very last moment. So, and, and that's kind of, that's so important for us to have that, create that, that flow, you know, and it, I don't think we, we don't intentionally create it, but it has to be there for us to create the work. All right, I want to turn it over to the audience. Are we doing the kind of thing where I'm passing a mic around or, or I mean, the rooms, I can get closer and just repeat the question if people want to not speak directly into something I've been breathing on. I trust your diaphragm. <laughs> So the question is, how much does venue influence the performance and and like and the like? I think I think a lot in many ways. I mean, that's kind of part of the process of kind of scouting out where is this going to, how can it exist in its best possible way. Um, and I think all of them have had a sense of reverberance. Uh, yeah, the, the acoustic possibility matters. for people to yeah. be able to move around and not feel as if it's kind of stadium style seating where you're all 
truly just observing the thing in a traditional concert setting, but in a way for people to really be a part of the narrative at the same time and be a part of the experience, just like a, a normal installation as you're moving through a gallery or, or through a museum, you're able to engage with it, move around, or you can also just sit and watch. So there's always chairs or cushions, but there's also a space for people to be able to kind of um, move around. I mean, I'll say that like, you know, the, the idea of a gallery is, is interesting. The, the blending shed, which was the venue in Huddersfield was not a gallery, but a warehouse. I felt like that was a very suitable venue for the piece because it was very unadorned. It wasn't, it was very plain and, and, and simple. Um, I think I agree. I couldn't imagine doing this on a concert hall stage or like a theater stage where... Not yet. I, well, maybe, I don't know. I don't, maybe. And I also, we've never really done the piece where people have been behind set, meaning can walk behind the pedestal. So I think that's an important space to preserve in the sense, while we <laughs> don't necessarily have a stage, it's important that people aren't becoming kind of interference to the show. They, we, but people can move around the work. So yeah, I, that answers your question. Yeah, so, so what is, is there a difference between the way that you prepare mm -hmm. Where I play the wooden cello. Yeah. <laughs> it's, well, that's it. It's, it's, um, you know, so much of it is, you know, the, I can't do the scales, but I, most of it is just physical. Well, a large part of it is physical conditioning because I know what I'm up against now at this point, now this many years into it. Um, so there's a, there is many, many months, at least six months in advance, I, I start the conditioning to get myself ready. Um, for that, because I know what I'm up against now. Early on, I thought, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to kind of go do this thing, and I really suffered after that for like three weeks. Um, and a large part of it, I guess in the same way from the my traditional concerts, is um, there's, there's a mental preparation that still goes into and trying to find that space of stillness um, and kind of knowing the subject matter of what I'm kind of about to enter into and what I'm about to share. I think it's also making sure I'm not shouldering that too much, mm -hmm. but I can also put myself in a space where I can enter into that and enter into it in the, in, in the most holistic way that in this point now is less filled with anger and is not as, it's not, I'm not as charged in the way I think I used to be. And now I've opened up to, a, to creating for myself and for those that come into the space, a space for healing for all, and they can find them find their own ways, you know. Instead of me saying this is what you're going to be addressed with, but I'm, we're presenting this, and you see yourself as you can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So kind of along the, the same lines, in your book, Classical Senses, you say um, how do you find a space to play and like just explore in this case. Well, I mean, I'll preface it by saying, I mean, controlled improvisation is a very much a part of our contemporary classical music practices. Um, and in many ways, we embody those same practices in this piece. Like, um, I think that training and that, the idea of like a particular free form area of a score that it requires a lot of attention and skill is kind of how we're approaching these, these areas or regions of the piece. What's maybe more spontaneous is the structure itself. And that's partly due to the fact that we're dealing with melting and crushing ice. You know, like on some level, there's things that just happen. Um, we don't have that video clip with us, but there's a moment in Huddersfield where Seth uncovers or de kind of discovers one of the pickups and starts breathing into it. And for some strange reason in that hall in the blending shed with the humidity in Northern England in the winter or November, it just started creating these like cloud off of the ice that just stood there. It just was completely surreal. And you kept going with it, and it was very loud. Son it was a very sonically loud moment, where it's just creating this like hanging cloud, and people are just stunned. They're just like, "Is that part? Is that a fog machine?" Or you know, so I think it's you know the, to answer your question, it's about being open to these moments to happen, and so that's I think a place of departure for this is like to allow those kind of to create artful moments that are not dictated by some predetermined score. And there's still the, the part of the choreographic score that I have to go over and remember what's there and maybe 
this transition to this transition still works. So for me, I'm still going through the notation, the physical, the physicalized notation, and how that can, can I segment that into this so I still at home, I have all the tools, so I'm still like freezing blocks of ice. <laughs> this is the only way to practice. This is my only way before I get to the actual thing. Again, you can't just go to a store and buy an ice cello. Yeah. Um, so, so this is the way for me to practice these ideas. I remember and I replay the recordings and I hear what has kind of already happened before. That is the way to kind of get back into the sonics, the rough sonic space and know what cues we have kind of already gone through and to make sure that we're still very clear on where the, where the possible apex, just like in any type of music, is going to possibly happen and what can happen in those moments. If I hear he's process something in this specific way to go back to it and hopefully he stays with me and if not I give him a, a look and then we move back or or I, yeah. or I choose to do it different because yeah. we're playing together I mean I think that's that breaking down of the hierarchy of hierarchy hierarchical aspect of the classical score is also important in this piece it's like you know there's such a history in our own country of not honoring music that's improvised um, so I think it's connected to that for sure it's another way in which you're amplifying the decay, right? That there's that making that not the part that you cover over, but that becomes the feature of it. These things are going to fall apart. They're going to deteriorate. Uh, they're going to transform. They're going to become also more fluid um, as it moves on. I think you had a question. Yes. Yeah, so for um, the ice shell and itself, when we're preparing it, it's about four or five days of freezing. So yeah. then when, I, when I'm actually, when we finally get it and it's on the stage, I'm, there's a lot of nerves rushing already, so I'm probably all, you know, the nervous sweat is already happening, but it's, you know, it's absorbed by the wetsuit. Uh, <laughs> you all are going to get to really know me really well. This is great. <laughs> um, so uh, as I'm working through it, I don't, I feel more warm up front in the very beginnings, um, but as the suit is starting to absorb the perspiration from, um, from the, the cello, it, I start to feel that. And the more, the closer and closer I get to it, once it really starts to, you know, to bleed in that way, um, I become colder and colder. Once, eventually, I think about the 30 minute mark, uh, my gloves are completely soaked. And so I go through these kind of hot and cold flashes, hot and cold flashes. And they, there are moments where you'll see me and I'm my whole entire face is just <sighs> full sweat. <laughs> so I'm like overheating. And there are moments where I have to like unzip part of the, the wetsuit just to kind of get some air in there um, for the fear that I, I don't want to have to pass out if I'm <laughs> overheating, but which is a, a, true, a true situation and how I felt many times and not feeling like I'm just, I think, you know, when you're running or you're running low on food or running low on blood sugar, you feel like you get the shakes. And so these are things that actually really come through to me. Again, I say I'm shouldering a lot physically through this process and, you know, there are no snacks on the stage, you know, to <laughs> reinvigorate yourself. So um, it's like an ice, it's like, hot and cold a lot a lot of the time but by the very end of it I'm completely soaked and it's just wet and cold and I've had to change to a different type of wetsuit at this point now because early on there was no padding there was nothing to kind of shield my knees to shield my legs and so once I've broken down enough of the cello I'm basically in these really jagged shards of ice that just feel like knives cutting into my legs and into my knees and so at this point now, I have these pads that are kind of built in um, to really help me through the entire performance because the first two performances, first three performances were really rough for me. So it's like the cold plus the knives, so that, that feeling at least. Um, yeah, I hope that answered. And then I think in, the, in this, the ice too, like the freezing process, there's actually like a really fi harrowing physical moment before we even, nobody sees it, which is freezing the ice cello. Um, just by happenstance on how we made the mold, it's a two-part mold that has to be very carefully clamped together. Um, and if it's not done right, it blows up.
like it explodes all over the place. You have to start over, and it's 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 a it's it's an ordeal because the water already that we're using is very cold. It's been pre-chilled to near zero, near freezing, to degas it and to prepare it. And being in there, you're in a four, ten to fourteen degree, you know, dark trailer or freezer. You're getting exposure after. 15, 20 minutes in this environment. It's very, very cold, and you're just trying to work as quickly as possible to get this done. So I would say that's another you know, hidden aspect. And that's really, an, it turns out, a very important part of this process to let it cool so long. I mean, you can make ice very quickly, but in our case, we want the ice to be very, very solid um, so it doesn't just accidentally shatter. And that was something we were very concerned about. Will it melt quickly or will it shatter quickly? And inadvertently, because of the way we did the mold, it ends up, um, freezing very slowly, and so we produce something that's closer between ice one and ice two, which is a more structured crystalline ice closer to permafrost. And so, like he's saying, you know, these ice shards aren't just like, oh, I'm going to crush this ice. It is incredible. It's like rock hard. So, um, yeah, that's kind of maybe to answer some questions about ice. Uh, yeah. Um, so as we think about bodies on display, the observation of bodies, objectification of bodies, um, and then as it relates to ice bodies, to this, to this work, um, and we think about the complexities that any modern day city has and the histories that have kind of come through those places. Um, I had to really reflect on, I think, you know, when Kate came to me, you know, about the idea, like, hey, bring this here, what would this be like? Would you be open to this? And um, by this time, not even, well, yeah, by this time, we'd already witnessed uh, the murder of George Floyd. And you know, so many times, so many things go through the news of awful situations that happen to people. And sometimes, you know, we really, we either really fear for them and we, there is a lot of heartache around that, or some people become so numb to it because it's day in, day out, hour after hour, week after week, month after month, year after year, of many of the same situations. and. In this situation, you know, I realized very quickly because I had seen a photograph um, that I was one person removed from George Floyd directly as being a friend of my brother. Um, and that made it all the more real and all the more reason to continue telling this story, to continue creating a space. And I have to say, you know, it's very charged for me uh, because I have to find a way to um, remove myself from the emotions and from the heartache and from everyone having to ha globally having had to relive, you know, that situation, you know, that awful situation, and that us creating a site-specific version for Minneapolis for the Twin Cities um, was still so relevant, and then that this piece, hopefully if people can come in open enough, can find another form of healing. Mm -hmm. And that this piece is not charged in a way of pointing blame, but it's more so to force people into the same space, to breathe the same air, mm -hmm. and to hopefully have conversation and you know, find a way to, to, to talk and find a way to love um, each other and to see, truly see each other. You know, the image of you covered with the purple, like, bruise, um, and then the edges cutting into you just kept chiming with this idea of bleeding blackness. Blackness just bleeding in that space. Um, and, you know, the slow, the slow deterioration in that. Um, let's see, let's make sure. Oh, we have a couple of minutes left. Are there We're any questions? <laughs> so where is the line? I'm going to move to the 
Tex I'm from Houston, Texas, oh, originally. Yes. Oh, okay. Your, your like, brother is from... My brother okay. is from also from Houston. Oh, yeah. okay. But okay. Floyd spent some time also in Houston, and that is how okay. they knew each other, yes. Well, I'll go back, and the overall concept from Jim is water becomes ice, becomes water, in this beautiful, ephemeral state of movement and evolution. Um, for me, I grew up by the water, <laughs> in many ways, and I've, I've always found a sense of peace, and even in the midst, from where I'm from, there's all these amazing... Well, I call them amazing, many people wouldn't call them that, but these tropical storms. And f me finding a sense of peace within that, even in the midst of the storm, it's always very, I don't know why it's calming, I don't know why I'm so calmed by it. Uh, probably just childhood of just kind of being enamored by that type of energy and that type of power and how it can give and it can take and it can rebuild and it can soften and it can harden over time. Um, and, I mean, I don't know. Um, I hope I'm kind of I mean, answering we, it. We, one, one thing we did early on was we created a reflection pool that's in front of the piece, and that it stays, at the beginning it's still, and it's a mirror, right? And I think that's, that's an important part is that these mirrors kind of exist hidden in the, in the piece at the beginning. They're the, it's in the glass, it's in the water. But then it, it becomes filled with ice and kind of the remnants, and it kind of becomes a vessel. So, and I, mean, I see myself in that mirror. You know, there are reflections as I'm playing it through. I watch as I observe myself on display, as I, re I observe the carving, as I observe the caring. So, I can see it at a certain point, and eventually it becomes shrouded mm -hmm. by the remnants, you know, that fill it. You know, the, the, oh, it's all gone. But the cavern, you know, flows directly into it. And what people are left with is to observe also, in, in a way, you know, to observe all the things that, that has kind of come through it. Um, yeah. Oh. Right on time, about to nail this dismount. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, uh, is, is there anything else you would like to, to, to say? We have three minutes, so if we have a, a question. Somebody would like. Three minutes for us. Oh, one last one. Um, I I've seen a lot of your paintings and everything, and I like the expansion of the space with the pond and the lots of sense of time to overlook paintings. Is there any like um, inspiration or things that you invoke that kind of music through the room movement, the the painting at the same time? I, I don't know. I just am interested to hear like. Well, it's 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 long form, <laughs> in the same way, and there are patterns throughout. The, I mean, we see there is the score. There there is this physical score you see here. There is the choreographic score, and there's loops. We call I can call them feedback loops in that way, right? And I play through many of these things. Sometimes you see. Um, I'll call it an additive process. You're getting a, a large part of the formula up front, right? And I extrapolate that over time. If we just think about just the physical. Spencer mutates that over time, and that's passed through either all of the panels, some of the panels mutated through the voice that to one hears, um, all looking at a, a sense of a long game. And at the very end of it, there is this elation, this almost... Um, I don't want a, a spiritual experience, as if you've, you know, they say, you've left it all on the stage, you know, in, in that sense, and it does transcend you. And, and the body changes, the mind changes, there's a clarity because you have pushed it all into this receptacle in that way. And even in this, the idea of the voice being the closest thing that can, in many ways, express, you know, express 
any emotion, whether it's it's human or it's it's a bird or it's, whatever it is, you know, it's a, it's a way to be able to communicate and to pass through time, and, and to tell the stories. Um, so yeah, in that in that way, yes, and I, I do love Avocats. Yeah. Yeah. I, in terms of minimalism, that concept, I think more of say Richard Serra's idea of minimalism or Sola Witt idea of like very simple lines and very simple and creating a lot of negative spaces. Um, Partly because I think there's there's kind of loudness to visual things. Like you want to give them their voice, not not kind of play over what's being heard physically on the ice and in his body, his breathing. To so those have to be audible. And so and, and there's periods where they're very exposed. And so I think it's about giving them a dialogue between the two. So. So it's not just like a really busy musical score that we're like over printing. But for me, it's more referencing drones, Alvin Lucier, like these spaces. Max Newhouse is another name, or Amache. Their idea of minimalism is incredibly, or even Morton Feldman, really these long stasis, these periods of stasis. And the chords that change are very kind of platonic. You know, um, and so, yeah, I, I think there is an element of minimalism, but it's definitely not the goal. And I think it is more of an additive thing where Poetry gets layered upon sound, gets layered upon motion. So, yeah. That's oh, what's the name of that series called? The Great Northern. Yes, yeah, the Great Northern Festival, which is on right now. Okay, you're going to be here next year. Yep. Also, at, at, in partnership with Great at Northern Weisman. at Wiseman. This piece, yes. Great Northern Festival. Yes, okay. it's awesome. Launch party yesterday. <laughs> it was cold, but it was great. You know, just getting you ready. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us. Can we please give them a hand, everyone? <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you all for joining us and holding space with us tonight. We really appreciate you coming out. Make sure you check out the Great Northern website to see all of the amazing artist activities that are happening across the Twin Cities. The Wiseman is now open um, after a long closure, so please come and walk through the galleries. And we all hope to see you next year when Seth and Spencer return to do the Ice Bodies performance at the Wiseman. Take care. <laughs>